the red flag flying here. Hello and welcome to Socialist Think Tank. Today we are here with Thomas Barlow. Hello, Thomas. Hello. How you doing? I'm absolutely fine. So we're going to go straight into it. What Sweet. is socialism to you? Well, I mean, this is potentially where I piss off all your viewers straight out of the gate and uh, and yourself, um, because, you know, I'm not a socialist. In fact, a lot of my political history or me coming up in the world, in the political world and activist world, has been very antagonistic to socialism. Like, by the time of Stop the War, not only was I like completely out of love with social democracy, I mean, even when I was like 14, 15 in the early 90s, the Liberal Democrats were more radical than the Labour Party, right? But I was also out of love with Leninists or, you know, and, and sort of revolutionary socialists because Stop the War drove home what I already felt and what I'd already grown up at home, you know, in Leicestershire reading and, and watching people like Mark Thomas and reading Naomi Klein and hearing about the Zapatistas and South Korean trade unionists and the Agoni people. And then like, I'd look at like the revolutionary socialists and, and they seem like from a bygone era, you know, um, maybe a bygone era that got us a bunch of stuff, right? But a bygone era when socialists used to think of themselves as being in armies and often commanders of armies as my dad used to say too many chiefs are not enough indians you know a lot of people who want to talk about their perfect world and how they're gonna and like what everyone else needs to do but like what everyone else needs to do not them doing anything themselves and the socialist workers party were the perfect example of that stop the war coalition took an issue where you had 90 percent of the british public on board right and agreed you had two million people who marched against it and then did nothing more with that. They, do you know what they did after that first march? People don't maybe remember this. They marched again. And a million people turned out for that second march. And they marched again, half a million for that next one. And quarter of a million for the next one. And I turned up to one with 50,000, which is still a big fucking march, right? But that's what they did. No imagination. They used it. It wasn't just no imagination. Their ranks swelled during that time. They thought they were doing great because the only purpose of the Socialist Workers' Party was to grow the Socialist Workers' Party. It was to sell papers and get more members. And I know because I was in it when I was 15, right? And that, that you know, that was what socialism was to me. Now, I'm going to come out with the, the good stuff, but it is worth noting that, like, in later life, I learned a bit more about theory in that. And it kind of confirmed what I'd already learned on the ground from the socialists I'd met because I was I was at Manchester Uni I met a lot of new Labour types and I'll tell you now they are lower scorn than than fucking Tories right they are more they hate the left more and know more about how to beat the left than any Tory does you can sit down with a Tory even a Tory MP and you can get them to agree on some stuff now they'll probably go and tell you to fuck yourself like after it but they'd at least concede that you were right even if they were going to do the selfish thing new labor types not at all so they're, they're the worst leninists are the worst. so i'd met them all in per person and i'd gone a different activist route one that was you know enthusing and i'll talk about in a tick but what i learned about theory is that old form of socialism wasn't an old form it's not the oldest form it's actually a break it's actually a break away and it's actually a great article about David Graeber in Salvage by a, a, an economist called James Meadway. He, he writes in an over, uh, overly academic way. But what he's talking about is there used to be one international, the first international. It was actually communists and a type of socialist that broke away from that um, and said, what we need to do is take over the state. That's how, as a, as a stepping stone to a global revolution. And it's kind of understandable, especially in an era pre the internet or pre, you know, these early days of, uh, of globalization. Um, so I'm not slating it, but very much like liberalism was this philosophy of the 19th century, you know, it was important because it did free the slaves, you know, it, it did create rights, individual rights and freedom of speech that we still cherish to this day. Socialism was very much, that socialism was very much a, a philosophy and practice of the 20th century, when 
everyone worked in the same workplace, when people didn't leave their country very much, when people didn't have much contact with the rest of the world, and when people were, by and large, wherever they lived, patriotic. And also, they often, for the, for the first two thirds of the 20th century, the majority of people in the world lived under empires. So if you were a nationalist, you might be a pan-Arab nationalist. You were fighting against an empire. So it was, you know, was progressive, right? Like it was. But in doing all of this, they created this way of doing things. It's top down, it's leaders, it's it's we're going to expand the state, not just to like give people health care and welfare and benefits, but whether they were social democrats or revolutionaries, they also always expanded the police state. They always expanded snooping on your lives, beating you up, taking away your rights. That happened every time in every experiment, whether it was siege socialism in the USSR or whether it was here in the UK, right? Because they become so in love with the state that they did whatever, anything was justified. And of course, the idea that socialism could exist in one country, again, relatively new, and it can't, we've proven that you can't have socialism in one country. You can get some reforms, but you can't have socialism, freedom, equality, democracy, you can't have those things in one country. It's going to have to be the whole world or not at all, right? They, they were, any socialist that took power would recognise they were under siege. I mean, even in the 70s, there was, people forget this, but the Times did, a, uh, there's a BBC documentary on YouTube and the Times did this investigation. They found there was a planned coup of the Labour government in the mid 70s and the army were going to uh, certain members of the army and minor royals and conservative MPs worked to, were working together and they were going to sail the QE2 down the river evacuate all the Tories from parliament into you know this ship and and take control and, and, and install a fucking military dictatorship so they were right to be paranoid and they were right to like try and centralize all this power but what got lost is that sense of freedom those important things and I think it's a famous anarchist, and I'm an anarchist, who said freedom without socialism is just privilege and injustice. But socialism without freedom is slavery and brutality. And I think we saw a lot of that in the 20th century. And that's what I came out of. And, and I think it's been proven that's the way it is. And I think the final proof of the pudding in this arena of how it is, is the, what happened to Corbyn. Now, like David Graeber, who's an anarchist like myself, and, and many other notable anarchists, no, Noam Chomsky, you know, uh, people who are anarchist-ish, like Naomi Klein, we all came out in support of Corbyn. I went and door knocked, you know, I support uh, the programme he was trying to implement because I'm not an idiot. <laughs> like, I don't, I don't want the world to get worse. You know, it might not be a revolution, but we certainly need some good news. But I was also aware, you know, and the reason I never joined the Labour Party is this was always going to fail because of my experiences in the past with the right of the, the Labour Party, but also the left. They both organise in the same way. It's about appointing people you trust, not people who are good at, at the job. It's about squashing other people's freedom and democratic rights so that you can have the power to do the right thing. You know, the right of the Labour Party think they're doing the right thing. The left of the Labour Party think they're doing the right thing. And I know a lot of left wing part members of the Labour Party, for instance, believe in having nuclear weapons, you know, for a workers bomb comrade, you know, like there's a lot of areas where they think, well, it'd be better that we have it. Socialists, good socialists have it than not. And that's where I see that that negative socialist. But there's a second one. I'll come to that. But I'll let you ask some questions. Uh, I think I think uh, the, the interesting thing for me there is like what you say there's a lot of what you say i agree with and uh, i i don't recognize it as my type of socialism i don't recognize what you've what you've said there as being the type of socialist that i am but you're absolutely right and that's what it's become in a lot of cases um and if you look at say fabian socialism like webb was a massive supporter of the uh, of the communist state in you know he was big 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 supporter of stalinism i believe um, and thought that was the right way to go about it because the state had to have power. But that's not what we're talking about. So I'm going to, I, I think you're about to come on to the, the type of socialism that we've spoken about quite a lot on this channel 
and we're trying to get the idea of bottom up socialism and what mm. that actually means. So it's not like the state giving you stuff, it's not the state controlling stuff. It's something very different to that. So is there anything you do identify with in socialism that you agree with? Yeah, and and this came to me at a later point. I think when you join when you sort of start discovering like where you sit in the world and and and, and what what is and I, I think actually by the way you know when people find out what anarchism is they they tend to agree with it like they tend to go oh yeah that makes sense you know the biggest criticism would usually be well it'll never work or it'll never happen or whatever um but they'll also go but it's common sense we should we should have control over our own lives you know why should other people be able to make decisions for us unless i want them to you know if i'd say yeah you go and you decide because you're a doctor like I, I want you to <laughs> decide what's best for me then then sound you know but like there's there's a sense that we live in a world where i could tell the manager or even the owner of a multi-billion dollar industry or pound industry that is my football team to fuck off and that i know better than him right and i'll know everything the ins and outs of my team fully bottom to top right and i probably am right and he probably does know shit all right and i can tell him that but we don't feel that way about politics and most of us don't want to even pay attention to the news right like because we can't do anything about it after a while you realize oh well the news just tells me that the world's shit and it's run by wankers and and I'll wait until there's some elections, then I'll pay attention. And in between, you know, what are you going to do? The kind of socialism I believe in gives you that hope that you can participate, that you can be part of the world and, and part of the decisions that affect you. Where does my water come from and my food come from, and my health care and the important things? That, well, they're all governed by a political economic system, these big words. They're all governed by other people and, and, and organisations that we've created, human beings have created. It's just administration right and with the right kind of administration we could all be living a lot more prosperous life we could be working less we could all have more food in our bellies we could all be worrying about the rent less you know and that's for everyone in the world we produce three times the amount of food in the world that people consume right we we produce twice the amount of energy we we don't need there, there doesn't need to be any scarcity we're already at a point where we're post scarcity right and if we embrace renewables and stuff like that, we could live in a world without scarcity. So what is this bottom-up socialism to me? It's it's the thing that I fell in love with anarchism. And it's, and it's the thing that I now quite happily will, you know, be described as a libertarian socialist, a freedom-loving socialist, right? Like it's forward-looking, it's freedom-loving, right? Like we care about individual rights, like about, you know, that everyone has a right no matter who they are or what they are like you know uh and that those rights are inalienable and universal we're pro-democracy real democracy not some centralized stuff not some leaders making decisions for us and we never get to have any say over what they do or we theoretically do in a pyramid democracy if you're in the party comrade no you know we we believe in participatory democracy and that means i mean in this country it would mean us or anywhere really in the world, us having to say over the way we work as uh, and where we work and over public resources like healthcare and education and water and so forth, right? That's democracy. It's about acting and not talking or at least talking whilst we walk, right? Like it's not, a lot of socialism in the old style, it was about meetings. It was about listening to a great white guy with a beard usually tell you what the, the truth was right like and then you to go out and go great that's great and i bought the paper and i'm a member of the party but it wasn't the anarchism i know and the libertarian socialism i know is about doing it yourself if there isn't something there then do what this channel does do it yourself build something start it if it is there make it better get involved like you know you've got to you've got to act because we'll all be judged on our actions not what we say not what we think or we believe and there's a still a lot in the world, in fact, maybe more so in the age of social media, where people are judged on what they think or they believe. I'll judge people on their actions. And that's the kind of socialism I believe in. We, the, the socialism that I love is against any dictator or centralization of power. We're suspicious of any centralization of power. Sometimes there is a justification for it, but very rarely. 
We should be very suspicious of anyone grabbing more and more power for themselves, you know, or any institutional organization. It should be shared amongst us all. And that doesn't mean we always have to be involved in everything, but it does mean that if we want to, we can be involved in decisions that affect our lives and not just our glorious leader telling us what to do. Um, I think, again, there's a couple more ones. So I've got a little list here because I was thinking about the question beforehand. No compromises. It's a really important one. Like, it's not to live in a world where we're daft and we don't want to make reforms and we don't want to like make things better, but also we can't fundamentally compromise on, on, the fr on protecting the freedoms of other people. We cannot let down people around the world by saying, well, they're not important at this moment. We'll chuck them under the bus. No, no compromises on that. I think it's creative and exciting. You can look back to the diggers and the ravers and the era of the English Revolution, which is often called the Civil War, right? And there's the levelers who are very pro-democratic, but it was a growth of many other creative movements as well. I think we should be anti-work. I think ultimately we should be trying to aim for a world where we, we don't work or we work very little. Uh, and by work, I mean not doing something. I'm not talking about doing something that's productive. I mean us working for someone else to make them money. Like we shouldn't be in that position. We should be doing things that are useful, but for ourselves or the community or our cooperative or whoever we're working with. And finally, this is the most important one. We want to be the, the change we want to see. And, and that's like some trite phrase. And often it's applied to like, I'm going to eat whole foods and, and or buy organic. What I mean is we're going to create the organizations that in an ideal world would be the organization we'd be in. We don't go, well, right now, what we need is an army so that we can get to, to a better world. Because guess what? When you build an army, it's only good at one thing, being an army. And that's what the country or the place that you take over with that army becomes you know and if you're going to build an army then look to say Rojava in northern Syria right where they built a decentralized gender equal like democratic army that's what you've got to look to we we have to act as if we were already free we have to be that change we in everything that we do and that means if we're going to be in a union we're going to be rank and file and with every other person there we're we're part of the people we're not a, a commander in chief if we're going to build something new we're going to do it as a cooperative it's going to be democratic and the rewards that, that are created by that are going to be shared by everyone who, who puts into it that's what i mean we've got to be the change that we want to see we got to act as if we're free there's so many ways i could take this interview now there's yeah. so many well, ways and I'm, I'm that was so, all my prepared uh, stuff sorry I'm, I'm, I, I, I've loved it and uh, it's, it's really interesting. Now what I want to go down, I, I want to come back to David Graeber in a, in a little while as well because I, I, I love David Graeber as well and uh, I think he's, he's book bullshit jobs. I've said on the channel so many times that it is a must read for anyone um, to, so I'm going to come back to work in David Graeber at one point. But I do want to know, like, so I think most people think anarchism is chaos yeah i think that's how it's always described and say like, well what do you want it to be well i think i just want a little bit of chaos i just want everyone running around doing whatever they want in completely directionless way is that what anarchism is uh no and <laughs> there's a form of the word that yes like let's not pretend that like language has no meaning if it's become common usage to use anarchy as um as sort of this chaotic you know fight of all against all then there is that element that is a common understanding but as a political philosophy uh, and as a practice and let's be honest it's more of a practice than a philosophy we don't have there are key people that i could say you know and, and name but anarchists focus a lot more on doing and the types of anarchism you can tell the difference between anarchism and socialism insofar as socialists will be considered Leninists, Stalinists, Gramscians, you know, uh, uh, Fabians, right? Like they'll be named after people or a club, whereas anarchists will be named after what is their key focus? What way do you organize? So are you an anarchist communist or an anarchist syndicalist, which is about workplaces? Are you a great, you know, an eco-anarchist or an anarcho-feminist or a, a trans-anarchist? 
or like which areas are you working in not like what person did you read uh, and you've decided to follow because anarchism is a living sort of philosophy but what it comes down to first and foremost is this the word means anarchon it means without a ruler and the idea is to live in a world without rulers not without rules but without rulers where we are all equal to each other and that doesn't mean like everyone gets exactly the same and that's one of the key differences i think again between that state socialism where you all get the same or whatever it's that we all have equal control over our own lives we we all are in a democratic and free society and that freedom part is a really important part you know it, the longest running anarchist newspaper in the uk it's called freedom and it's called that for a reason we put a premium on individual rights freedom of speech and freedom of thought and expression and you'll see that anarchists often seem far more creative and unruly and bizarre you'll look at extinction rebellion or you look at the environmental movement the anti-roads movement in the uk or or even the student movement which was they're all very heavily anarchist inflected and you'll say that seems unruly and crazy but the world we want to see is one without borders without bosses without a violent state because let's remember what the state is. Everyone thinks of it now, the welfare state and good things about it, but you can take all of that away and still have a country. A state is what the what's left. When you take all of that away, what things do you need for a state? An army, police force, and prisons, right? That's what a state is. And anarchists are very much anti-state. They believe that we can create a world where there are no states, no borders, and administration in a, it is utilized to share resources. So admin means workers control their own workplace and the work that you do, you're in control of it. You don't work for a boss. The house that you live in is yours. It's not some landlords, you know, because those are hierarchies. Those are rulers. Those are people you want to get rid of. Same with elected politicians, because at the moment, the way it works is you elect someone and they tell you what to do rather than you elect someone and they do what you tell them to do because they're, they're there to serve you, right, and do things for you. So anarchism is that, that socialism. Certainly my anarchist communism is. I'm an anarchist communist, really, but a libertarian socialist would be a fair way of saying it. You know, there are other deep green anarchists, for instance, or minarchists who focus on, say, let's have a federation of cities or whatever. There's different ways of realising this dream. But you've got, with anarchism, that stateless, classless society that we're aiming for, which is what communists and socialists are aiming for. The difference is that we believe that you have to be that change. You, the way that you organise will determine what outcome you get. Like, if you organise like an army, you'll get a violent state. If you organise uh, with a centralised structure and a leader, that's what you're going to get. If you organise in a way where everyone is equal, or give it, it is able to participate in decisions, then you'll create a society like that. And that's the major difference between us and socialists. It's not everyone against everyone. It is, the, the other, I think, major important thing is that it has to be global, realistically. And that term, think global, but act local, is another key thing about it. We won't necessarily always focus on the state. We might look, focus on our local community or our workplace or whatever it is that's our focus. The thought will always be that the aim is all of us in the world united. And we're part of a global movement. And that that's, that's what anarchism is. So ultimately, you'll only realize anarchism when there is a true global movement and we all know that and there won't be there's no sort of interim we can make changes and reforms along the way but the aim is we are part of a global movement that makes a change and of course that makes sense because the majority of the working class are not in this country they're around the world you know so i'm just trying to think of what the other what are the usual criticisms of anarchism i, I hopefully i explained it there okay i think you did i think you've uh, you've explained it really well it's just you know, to me, I feel like I'm learning learning something as well. But there's a lot I relate to. Then I bet you our uh, our viewers and listeners will be relating to a lot of what you've said there. Like it isn't this chaotic thing. There is a there's a little thing before I'm going to come on to David Graeber, which is um, 
some people have described Boris Johnson as an anarchist. And I think it's to do with his libertarianism, mm. but he is like a sort of a right wing libertarian, as in he doesn't want any rules for his bad behavior. You know, that, that's that's where it comes from. Have you any thoughts on that? <laughs> Again, they're using the, that sort of like they're using that negative use of the term when they talk about it. But let's get it straight. The Americans have polluted the global conversation with their use of libertarianism because in America, libertarianism or right is a sort of right wing philosophy. It's free market fundamentalism or uber liberalism, really. Like it, it's um, a war of all against all right and and everything is governed by contracts and private ownership and there's an old joke you know about anarchists which is like you know what does an anarchist drink you know uh, earl grey because pro or something because property is theft i can't remember the fucking line but we believe that property is theft we don't mean private property your computer your house or whatever we mean uh, like sorry personal property we mean private property where you own someone's workplace or own them at work essentially because they work for you to make profit for you or you own their house that's the property that we're against and that's fundamental to anarchism so right-wing libertarianism this free market fundamentalism is nothing to do with anarchism and it it's um because the working class has been so poorly organized in the u.s probably the least developed uh, working class in the world historically uh, historically at a high point and weirdly enough that was very inflected by anarchism they have labor day there that's um uh, you know a commemoration of the haymarket murders of anarchists and the iww was an anarchist union that that they used the pinkertons to come in and shoot them you know like americans have very violent repression you know because it was a very violent country they were their working class got destroyed and because of that um you know, and this wave of the new left, actually, in the 60s and the hippies and stuff like that, they sort of use this term libertarianism. Ayn Rand used it, you know, and and it's sort of built from there. And and, and some of them even like people, what's his, it's called Peter, um, he's Canadian, Peter Stefanovic or something, I can't remember his name. He... Uh, he calls himself an anarchist and these and there's even like a stream of it they call themselves an anarcho capitalist and every other anarchist like attacks them constantly on message boards because free market fundamentalism cannot be anarchism because you cannot live in a world without rulers when a free market fundamentalist is not free market you you have a market where people are bought and sold contracts are bought and sold where someone can own you where someone can be your boss that cannot be anarchism there cannot be a world without rulers if that is so it's partially that but also johnson isn't even a libertarian in that right-wing sense he's uh you know i mean as covid has shown he's quite happy to economically dole out the cash he's um he's a cronyist and he's a kind of old school right winger way like i'll just reward the people who help me out like he'd he's like a, a classic right wing libertarian would be osborne and cameron they believed in thatcher's philosophy and thatcher really didn't believe it she just used it as 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 rhetoric as cover to get people on board you know i'm going to get the state off your back and free you they actually believed it because they're two generations down the line or a generation down the line and they applied that stuff and it didn't work it destroyed the british economy right and it set britain back a long time but there are conservatives who don't believe in that free market bullshit and johnson's one of them so he's not even one of those he's an anarchist in that very negative sense of being like a knob but um he's not even that kind of anarchist he's just a nepotistic greedy self-serving egotist um who's also by capitalist standards kind of incompetent um so you know that's who he is i don't think anarchist applies to him at all so the, the next thing i'm going to ask you then i'm going to go on to david graeber in in this point you've talked a lot about work you've talked about how um how you know people can own your time and i think that's that's the key i don't think you, you actually said that but that's what you're talking about ownership aren't you people own your time while you're at work they own you for that period of time yeah. so um and a lot of the jobs so 
speaking about David Graeber, you can go in any direction here. I'm going from the point of view of bullshit jobs uh, where he was saying there's all sorts of jobs that capitalism creates. So we've had a, a little kind of go at a certain type of socialism here. Let's have a go at capitalism. So capitalism creates these weird jobs that don't really exist, don't really produce anything, and they're just there to kind of prop up the system. So uh, let's go down that route. Tell me a little bit about that. Well, there's two. Uh, just one thing I wanted to mention about owning time, and then I will come to these sort of bullshit jobs. Is a capitalist or your boss doesn't just own your time whilst you're at work. By paying you badly, they own your time when you're not at work for all the things you've got to do to maintain yourself, to keep yourself alive, right? All the cooking, cleaning, the traveling. You know, in France, where they're like of strong unions, for instance, a few years ago, they made it illegal for your boss to message you outside the work, right? And that, like, you know, things like your boss's, say, if you worked for Amazon, and I did at the warehouse for, for a while, my boss didn't pay any taxes in this country. So he didn't pay for the roads or, or, the, or the public transport that got me to his workplace uh i'm paying for that as a taxpayer and a customer right your boss owns your time almost all of your time you'd be surprised how little spare time you've got that your boss doesn't own because when you are at work you're there working for them to make money now in our country it's hard to sometimes get our heads around this because we've developed to this point where we're sort of almost post-production and this is where the bullshit jobs comes in like we often get to do jobs that we actually quite like or we see some meaning in them if they weren't just run so badly there there might be some value in them you know you might be a teacher or a nurse or something like that and we'll come on to that in a tick um and, and so you're like well i'm not really owned by the school board or the nhs you know like they don't own my time i want to do this i like helping people um you still got to do it or else you can't live right and try living on the dole you can't do that for much you can't do it like you used to and we're lucky again in, to be in a place where you can though live on that for a while but you know many places in the world you can't but in that sense it's misery and penury or working for someone who usually and people who work in the nhs and in education will tell you isn't managing what you're doing right education could be a fantastic job so why do 50% of teachers leave after three years? Like, you wanted to do it. You had a calling to teach children, to impart knowledge, to help the next generation take on the challenges of the world and make it better, right? But you can't do it because it's organized so badly. You work 60 hours a week. You run ragged. You're told to teach things in this piecemeal fashion. And you're told to teach not lies, but things that aren't quite that useful. And you're not allowed to let people learn at their own rate. Everyone's got to go through this factory system. You've got to get to here by this age and here by this age. Right. So that's even the good jobs. Now, my brother works in pensions administration and he will tell you there's loads of bullshit in that. There's no point to a lot of the work. Yet it's a, it's, it's a really important job, right? People getting paid their pensions that they've des deserved after a lifetime of work so they can live in comfort. So why is there so much bullshit? Why are so many people in the workplace not really doing anything? You know, because you don't have to. And that's because capitalism has got to this point and Meadway is an economist for the New Economics Foundation and help, was on Corbyn's uh, McDonald's advisory board, in fact, points this out that capitalism has decoupled from production in the global north. In our, like, we're consumers now. We're just doing work because there's some sort of moral good in doing it. Because also, there's no moral good. And that myth is perpetuated um, despite our productivity going down as human beings were in this country, we're producing less for the amount of time that we're spending. We're doing things we don't find satisfying. Something like 50% of people have said that they don't see a point in, a, in some or a lot of their job, right? The, the jobs we're doing are pointless or badly done. And, and Graeber suggests a solution, which is we need to, in the modern world where a lot of things are produced very easily for us, energy, broadband, food, right? Less than 1% of people now work on producing food in the population. That's amazing. That could free a lot of us up to work shorter weeks to do things that are more useful. 
And in that, he says, what we need to do is switch the economy so that we focus on work that is useful for humans, things that robots can't do, because there's going to be a lot of automation. Well, robots can't look after you when you're in the hospital. Robots can't teach you to uh, love yourself or love your friends or help you build a community or, uh, uh, you know, teach pastimes. They can't be teachers. They can't look after elderly people and we're going to have an explosion in need of, uh, of social care as the baby boomers are just hitting 70 now right we need to fundamentally as people we don't just critique this stupid system of work and it's even more stupid now that we're doing work that's completely fucking pointless we need to say well this is the way that we can make work mean something again we can do something of value and that's you know, some of Graeber's genius. There's a lot of great genius, but one of the best things about him is, unlike, again, a lot of people that I'd call traditional socialists or this old socialism, he writes and speaks in plain English. He doesn't put it behind a wall of weird Marxist vernacular. And he's not a super academic. You can read bullshit jobs. It makes sense. And you're like, yeah, that makes sense. I see that in my life. I, I, you know, it's, it's incredibly important. It's, you know, and um, his loss is, his death is a massive loss to, to all of us. Um, he's, he was a wonderful and beautiful human being as well. He was just a funny, odd guy. Uh, I've got a lot of love for him. So um, yeah, it's nice that you brought him up because that's one of his key concepts. And I don't know if you could expand on it better, but that's my perception. I certainly couldn't do any better. I can uh, I can add my own thoughts on that, but just it just um, it was just the no the normality of the way the way he's able to describe the conditions that we're living under, and there was a lot of humour in there as well. Like he's 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 funny with it, but you're just laughing along, going, "God, you're right. You got this is this is totally stupid." And I was pleased you mentioned things about teaching as well, because why is teaching such a a difficult profession to work in at the moment and it is that like we're doing some really stupid things all the time and most of the job of teaching is actually outside of the classroom now it's actually to impress people outside and it's box checking so as as david graber describes in bullshit jobs what you're doing is because you've got a middle manager who needs to justify their role they're making you tick a load of boxes rather than doing the only important thing in teaching is teaching children that is the only important thing. And whether that's teaching them, you know, how to socialize or whether that's teaching them how to do maths or whether it's history or anything, any, any amount of things, the important thing is contact time with those kids and telling them what they need to learn and helping them to develop as human beings. Whereas actually what most of the time teachers are doing is ticking things in different colored pens and you know because some idiot came up with some sort of system somewhere that Ofsted liked you know that's that's where we are and I think that's one of the reasons I related to it and I'm sure so many people would so definitely read bullshit jobs if you've got or, 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 or do the audio book or do whatever you want to do yeah. because it's it's well worth it yeah so I'm gonna... little... oh sorry just a couple of recommendations no. on that theme David Graeber also did and he narrated it and he's got a funny voice a BBC radio series on debt the first 5,000 years. And again, he highlights something that no one else was pointing out, that this whole system, we talk about it in a big sense, the financial system is built on debt, but our personal lives are built on debt. And that, that it's not just about a money thing. Here's the thing about it anthropologically, because he's an anthropologist, is there's a moral thing about debt that you, and, and you can feel it. When you're in someone's debt or if you're in debt generally, you feel panicked, unsure, unhappy. Uh, and it's shown, psychological testing has shown that if you're in debt, it leads you to make worse decisions because you're uh, under a lot of stress. And when you're under stress, you look at short term gain rather than like making sort of like more rational uh, decisions in your own interest. Right. Like people who are in debt often, for instance, will gamble or take payday loans. Right. Like it's, you know, because you're like, how do I get out of debt? Because it feels bad. And it goes all the way back thousands of years, this moral thing about it. But also the box ticking thing. There's a documentary by Adam Curtis, the weird filmmaker called, I think, All, uh, all Looked Over by Machines of Love and Grace. And it's about, especially under Blair, this uh, just explosion of box checking bullshit, you know, like it's just utter bullshit. And 
you know, who are the people who decide what boxes to check and whether it's of any value? You know, it's, it, it becomes cretinous. Again, you know, you see it in healthcare. The most important thing is looking after patients. So why is so much time taken up with admin? Um, and why doesn't the, why does the health service have such bad IT? Anyways, sorry. Yeah, we, we could go a totally yeah. different route <laughs> sorry, down there. Sorry. But but what I do want to what I do want to talk about now is you're involved in independent media and we're independent media. And I want to talk about the importance of it because we've got this like massive machine of uh, non-independent media that is telling us stuff all the time, telling us what to believe. And um, I mentioned this on a on a show I did recently. Um, when uh, when the BBC put the Russian hat on Corbyn and, and stuff, they had thousands and thousands of complaints and they said, nah, it's fine. You know, we didn't do anything wrong. But then um, recently they referred themselves to the independent complaints thing. I can't remember, can't remember exactly what it was, but um, over Emily Maitlis saying that Dominic Cummins had broken the rules, you know, that speech she did on Newsnight and there was a big fuss. They referred themselves to that and there were like five complaints went in about that, that entire topic. There were thousands went in about Corbyn, five went in about Emily Maitlis. Two were saying she shouldn't have said that. Two, out of all the people who watched the BBC, two. Three were saying, why are you disciplining her? You know, so that, like, they've referred themselves. So what is going on with non-independent media? Because the BBC should be independent media. And what is the importance of independent media? Yeah, well, let's talk about the state of the media. And I can, I'm, I'm getting close to being able to do this briefly now. There's three key elements to it in the UK, right? Um, and generally across the world, you'll see this more or less the same. You've got um, a state broadcaster, a public broadcaster. Now, in places like Germany, it's more decoupled from the government. Here it isn't. I'll go into that. You've got the national press and you've got big tech now. Google and Facebook basically take around about 80 percent of advertising revenue that goes to news that should go to news. And it doesn't. And that is devastating. Uh, the uh, environment in which we create truthful, factually accurate news. Because when you starve it, uh, uh, journalists of funds, and now 60% of trained journalists work in PR, they don't even work in journalism, right? Like, then you don't get factually accurate news. You, you, you also have created algorithms that uh, basically reward uh, extreme emotion, eliciting extreme emotion, basically getting people angry right? More than it does giving people useful information about the world. That's the system that you've created, right? And so into that world comes massive amounts of conspiracy theory, massive amounts of fake news, but also the right-wing news that was already geared up to elicit emotion because they can't appeal to your rationality. It's not rational to hate people you've never met and have done nothing wrong to you when you're getting screwed by the government and big business so they have to uh, you know go oh the gays oh the teachers the hippies the scientists the the uh, the socialists the, the you know women uh, right and and somehow make you angry about that ideally white men because they're the only people that you really uh, need to make angry because they're where all the power is right that gets rewarded by big tech as well. And they don't want to be regulated. They don't want to be seen as independent, uh, as, as media, as, as news providers, right? So th there's actually a massive fight going on in Australia right now, and it's kind of ended, and it's kind of a score draw between the nation state and, and Facebook and Google. They both sort of fought over what's going to happen. They don't want to be regulated. And so they're going to do a deal with the press. And the national press, 70% of it is owned by three billionaire families, right? 70% of it, do they? And those billionaire families who are losing money in this all the time nowadays are funded by advertising from multinational companies. So are these guys giving you information about the world that you need, or are they trying to turn you away from information that would be critical of them and, their, and the people who pay for them? We know it's the latter, right? It's in their interests. We know with big, uh, with big tech, ultimately it's in their interest because again, they're billionaires. And they make their money from businesses. And that's why Facebook is saying we're depoliticizing Facebook. So you're not going to be able to do stuff on there. And you want to read politics. They don't mean we're going to chuck off all politics. 
they're going to work with the Daily Mail and the Express and, and other far right rags like the Spectator, who are often found to be untruthful, factually inaccurate, and um, obviously represent positions that are divisive, aggressive and terrible, right? That, those will continue. No, it's the rest of us, ordinary people, small groups. That will include small groups of Nazis, but that will be the minority. The majority are going to be the left. The left's done. We've got three to six months to pack our bags and get off Facebook and find another way of communicating with our audience because we're fucked. We're finished, right? And then you've got the BBC. The BBC has always been a state broadcaster from the beginning. There's a great book by a guy called Tom Mills, and he tells it in a storybook fashion. It's called The Myth of a Public Service. Tom Mills, check it out. Right? It tells you the story of the BBC. And it was founded during the First World War as a propagandist service. And it is, as John Pilger says, it's the most refined propagandist service in the world because it makes people trust it in a way that you don't trust Russia today or Al Jazeera uh, or, or anyone else, really. It has a global reputation for accuracy that is partially deserved. It does have rules in place around factual accuracy. It is now regulated by Ofcom as well and not internally. But also, until the late 90s, it had MI5 had offices in there and checked not only scrutinised every member of staff, but everyone who went on there. And I'm pretty certain they still scrutinise every person that goes on there. I'm pretty certain that they used to give them a red stamp. Um, and famous historians like Eric Hobsbawm were, were, were red stamped off. You know, you, they, they so very much like the billionaires control a type of media in their interest. The state controls a type of media in its interest, and it doesn't want anyone rocking the boat. It doesn't want anyone questioning anything. And as Chomsky says, another famous anarchist, there is debate allowed within a very narrow perimeter. And then you have very lively debate, but let's not consider anything else. And anyone, and you saw it with Corbyn, he comes along and says something that, hey, 80% of the public think we should nationalize the railway. Should we do it? you know he's a he's a communist he's an anti you know blah blah i'm not going to go into all the things that they've said about him but it you know they chucked at him for five years every kind of bullshit and tried to see what stuck and two things did stick and we know what they are and we know the outcome of that because it is managed by the elite and who is the chair of the bbc well currently it's uh Chair of the Board of Directors is someone who's donated 400 grand to the Tory party and has spent 23 years working at Goldman Sachs. The Director General, I might have got this the wrong way around, but one of them is a former Deputy Mayor and Councillor and has worked in the Tory party forever. And Ofcom, the regulator, is being given to Paul Dacre, the former editor of the Daily Mail during its worst period ever, with more, three times more official complaints than any other publication. We're talking the Sun here during his time, right? Who after the Levis inquiry said, we're not gonna regulate the press, set up his own regulator called Ipso. And, it, and has not, it has not taken one official complaint through to completion yet in five, six, seven years, right? That's the state of the media. It is a big club and we're not in it. No, it's a small club. It's a small club for billionaires. It's populated by the state and the elite. And the majority of people, by the way, who work in those top positions are privately educated as well and that's only seven percent of the population so we know who runs that and yet with all these resources with all this money poured in with all this hate and control uh put out there like and utilized to control our democracy and that's what the purpose is right they still never get more than around about 30 percent of the population to agree with them because any government of the day at tops, it gets about 40% of people who vote, which is about 30% of people who live in the country. And usually it's more like 20, 25%. And even then there's dissent within those that percentage. So the majority of people still aren't hoodwinked by this, but it is still an enormous machine. And we're living in the age of, we've gone from the internet 1.0 to 2.0. And this is the point in capitalism when the doors close, you know? Um, and uh the market closes and they shut all the doors to little upstarts so now's the time for us to make our own thing well look the the independent media as a sector is actually very young you know in the past as i say there's that old form of socialism which has relied on on parties with their papers 
you know and then with the morning star and to a certain extent the the mirror and back in the day uh, i think it was was it called the herald which became the sun was the most read paper in the country and it was very left wing right so we had a place in this ecosystem and we had a way of working the new media that's come up with this age of the internet 2.0 is five to ten years old and is not you know some of them like red pepper new internationalist they're older um new internationalist is 40 years old but it's quite young and we are working out how to work with each other and um I started off doing a welfare rights blog or working on one uh, in my spare time called Real Fair. And then I founded an organization called Real Media. And then I founded, uh, uh, and that's still running to this day. Check it out, Real Media is really good, uh, realmedia.press. And um, it does sort of activist journalism and, 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 campaign and, and, and videos about uh, campaigners and stuff like that, stuff the news won't cover. And then there is, um, uh, I founded the Media Fund, and the Media Fund has just reconstituted as the Independent Media Association, and that is a collection of about 40 media organisations that are working together to start building ways of getting funding in from the trade unions who are going to be dead without, like, the trade union membership is ageing and it's dying. There's the Young people don't see any point in unions any longer. And it's very expensive to organize in the, the old way. They, I was told by someone at Unite, you need a workplace of 200 people to afford one organizer, right? To truly afford one. Like, and people don't work in workplaces that large any longer, not much outside of the public sector. So the unions need to support it and, and we need to get funding from the public and the public need to see that they have to pay for their media because if they don't pay, then someone else is paying and we we know what interests they're going to be representing it's not going to be our interest so you have to pay for this information because journalism costs it costs my time and i need to eat it costs travel and research and skills it costs lawyers costs because we have to stop ourselves from getting sued and there's a good reason for that we need to be regulated we need to make sure that we put out uh, factually accurate truths into the public arena so that you can make decisions about the world and actually participate in a democracy a you know democracy like rule by the people where we rule our own lives if we don't change the media we are not going to win anything else fascism will rise the environment will be destroyed women will be oppressed the working class will be smashed like all any struggle that you can think of is going to be devastated unless we create a media that is coordinated, that sets the agenda and is well resourced. We have to get it together. Now, there are some big ish independent media that are doing quite well. They're financially sustainable. Um, I think we've mapped out there's a good like 100 organizations in the UK that we think would left independent media. And we don't just do left, by the way, we'll, you know, but it tends to be the, the right don't produce any independent media um but uh they think they're doing well because they're financially sustainable but we're still not reaching beyond the people we always talk to we have to not mobilize the existing audience but organize within audiences that we haven't spoken to and when i say audiences that's fellow citizens fellow people other people we need to chat to people like we used to down the pub when I, I grew in a, a place that was a former mining town and worked in a warehouse, and we'd all go to the pub after work every night because that's the way it was. And you might not agree, and there were sun readers in there. There's a lot of sun readers. There's a lot of people who were, you know, there's some people who are royalists and stuff like that. But guess what? You're all in the same place. And you'd argue almost every night it was a better political education than I ever got at uni, right? But it was sound. And you knew you'd won an argument when you heard them saying it the next week, the exact same thing that you'd said to them, you know? And by the way, they won me round on some stuff. You know, whoever you're arguing with, you, that was the thing. We need to get back to that. We need to be not afraid to debate people that have differing opinions. Um, but most importantly, like I say, we've got to tackle these very boring things that no one on the left wants to do. Everyone wants to be the hero journalist. Everyone wants to have the show. Everyone wants to do that stuff. Now I've done the dirty things of, I've run festivals. I've run my own company. I've founded cooperatives. I know how to do, I'm a trained project manager and I know how to do the accounts. We have to learn those things. 
because capitalists don't teach us those things because they wouldn't give you an education system where you learn how to create a mortgage or what the laws of your country are or how to run a business successfully because then you would have the skills needed to create wealth for you and your community and power and that doesn't want to be changed well we have to teach ourselves those things build independent media that's strong enough to challenge and eventually replace or certainly replace for enough of the population that we can say just like the right-wing press have got their 20 or 30 percent that they've got on lockdown we've got our 30 40 percent that we're like we're talking to you every day we're giving you information about the world that's useful it's not you know hate your neighbor it's this is what's going on with the world and here's the final thing i'd say about it we need to talk a lot more about solutions than problems because the news is depressing and yet solutions are being created every day and movements to change are winning or fighting every day let's talk about that that's inspiring you know so normally we end up on um on what's your hopeful vision for the future what do you hope to achieve in the future you've really tapered into that so we get this right how do things change? I think the aim should be for the next 10 years, within the next 10 years, ideally within by the next election, to the key policy focus, the key win, reform that we could hope for that will enable a lot of others would be the Green New Deal. And I believe, honestly, that the Conservatives could be pushed there as easily, if not maybe more easily than Keir Starmer, quite frankly. I believe that the electoral system at its best is a weather vane. It goes where the wind blows and we're the wind. So we have to see ourselves as that. And we have to organize a mass movement. And to do that, what we're gonna to have to do first and foremost is invest massively in independent media and support uh, uh, media campaigns. There is a media campaign going, starting shortly, done by the Media Reform Coalition, which will be against Murdoch setting up a new TV station in this country, because the last thing we need is fucking Fox News UK, because we will see fascists charging Parliament in five years if we get this station, okay? And there's GB News being set up by Andrew Neil of The Spectator. So we have to support those campaigns. Uh, so check out the Media Reform Coalition and check out the Independent Media uh, Association. Those two institutions will fight what exists and create something new. Um, they have to be beefed up massively. And if we do beef them up massively and we target marginal constituencies for the electoral process, we could get this Green New Deal. We could say, listen, Boris, Keith, whoever it is, mate, I will savage you in every marginal in this country, right? if you don't give me the Green New Deal. If you do, I'm still going to criticise you, but it won't be savage. I will, but I will hammer you. We will coordinate it. That's what we need to see happen. And my hope is that we get a Green New Deal that then pumps money into the economy, into the British economy, into transitioning away from destroying the planet. And in doing so, enables us to start doing less bullshit jobs, start having more free time to focus more on caring for each other. And in doing so, we become freer people because there have been periods, the 90s is a great example, when Dole was called the activist wage, right? When people were able to have a lot more leisure time, they were also able to be more creative. They were able to resist more and win campaigns more and change things more and have a vision of the future. And that's the breathing space that we need now to have that vision of the future that we can eventually end up in a oh, classless, stateless world, one species holding hands <laughs> and all that good shit. Thomas, you're coming on again. Yeah, man. Yeah, defo. Let's get bevied. <laughs> Brilliant. Thanks again on behalf of Socialist Think Tank. We really appreciate it. I've loved it. And uh, take care. Sweet. You too.